Welcome to Fishing Britain. This week, Charlie Jacoby, he goes all Jack and Nori on us. We've got a member of the Daiwa Gordon League taking on the target, and the old favourite, hooked on YouTube and Fishing Britain News. But first, we received this in the post. Hi Harold, Andy at in London here. Look mate, I've been watching the 120 challenge, and yeah, it's been really cool, you've done really well. You've been catching them on black buzzers, you've been catching them on gummy minnows. But come on man, it's all been stock still water fishing so far, that's easy. Why don't you bring you and your boys up to Derbyshire, we'll fish a beautiful stretch of river, we're going to catch a wild brownie on a dry fly in the 120 challenge. I'll see you there. Right, the challenge has been set, so let's go off to the dove to see what he's made of. My name's Andy Buckley, I work for a London fishing tackle shop called Farlow's. I've been fishing, uh, fly fishing now for 20 years. Um, I kind of grew up fish fishing this stretch of river, so I really think I've got a good chance of beating Hal today. Um, I've worked in a couple of different tackle shops, different parts of the country. I also spent a year living as a fly bum in New Zealand, catching really hard wild trout over there. So I'd like to think my experience is going to set me up really well for today. Right, let me remind you what the Vineyard 120 challenge is. We've got two hours, we're given an envelope, and then we have to decide what we're gonna tie to go and fish with. All the kits ready, the rods, reels, and lines, but we've got no flies, so can I have the envelope, please? The timer is ready. Two hour countdown. Start. Here we go. Right, Andy, mate. Here we go. Here we go. Right, let's go. <laughs> right. right, we're river fit. Oh, stuff it. Okay, for it. Let's put it all on there. Right, silk, black silk. Oh yeah, silk. jungle cock, perfect. Jungle cock that for the river. Useful for yeah. Absolutely nothing. What size hooks have we got? Shed load of flies. Hooks. Sixteen hooks, so even twelves, fourteens, and eights. They'll be useless. Some Jim's mayfly wings. Right, which one do you want? Uh, I'll be, I'll be nice. You can have any Kalee oh, one. That's kind of you. I'm going to go for the lighter one. Okay, go for that. Right, this is speed tying. So, got to tie the flies, but also. The thing is, it's the first one to catch a fish. So it's flies, tie, catchy fish. Which should be good. But what are we going to tie? I haven't got a clue at the moment. Have you got anything in mind? I'm, um, I'm shocked by the selection. Right, OK. Well, <laughs> listen, i got to pick your brains. This is your stretch. You fish it all the time. So when we were walking up, we did see a few fish rise. But there's not much to tie I've a dry seen, fly. I've not seen a whole lot there that we can tie dry fly with, Hal. So. I think that's going to be a, a bit of bodging going on here with a few materials. <laughs> Did the bodging. I love bodging. Right, with all this material in front of me, it's a nightmare. What am I going to tie? Teal, flank. Um, first thing that comes to mind is a cased caddis. Any river cased caddis. So, starting off with a silk, but the problem is my bobbin holder is not that good. Righty, not easy this. We've got a really poor selection of kit. We've got three packets of hooks. We don't really need three different sizes of hook. We've got synthetic jungle cot. What use is that to us? What we have got is some teal flank, and we've got a couple of different uses for that. We've got some copper wire, and we've got some fairly sensible thread. So I think if we can work with these through logically, we've got a good chance here of time flies that are going to catch fish really quickly. Second plan is just use a whole much, or, or as much of the copper wire as I can. Wrap it round, but leave a little bit as a tail. Now the tail is there to represent the insect popping out. Then wrap as much to get the weight, because we've got no gold heads, we've got nothing. Just wrap and wrap and wrap and wrap and wrap. And then just get the teal flank. And what I'm doing is just ripping off as much on, dubbing it on, dubbing it on, rip it off, dub it on, keep going, keep going. I'm going to have a go here at tying a kind of generic, hair's eerie, olivey nymph imitation, a little bit of everything, but quite small. Because at this time of year, we're starting to get smaller olives hatching. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to use the fluffy bit of the bottom of the teal flank feather as a dubbing. It's kind of grey, it looks a bit buggy and it floats around nicely, so that'll be cool. I can use the nice striped teal flank uh, feather for the tail, and then we can use copper wire and make a head with the copper wire at the front. A couple of times, a couple of half inches just to finish the fly off. The one thing, if you had time and you're doing that, the ideal thing is burn the whole feather with, with a lighter and it just blackens it out. That's it, fly done. Let's get fishing. Go, go! One fish. That's all you need to catch.
Now unfortunately we haven't got any tungsten beads, so what I'm actually going to do, I pulled a little bit of a flanker on a howl here and I don't think he knows it. What I've brought with me is a couple of coarse fishing split shot. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to rig up with that at the bottom of a two, of a, of a two fly rig. What that's going to do is pull this much lighter nymph down to the bottom where the fish will be feeding at this time of day. And I reckon that's going to give me a great chance of eating it here. I'm actually fairly pleased he's gone up there because generally in this pool they stack up down at the bottom end. This is where local knowledge is going to win it. So it'll give me a chance. Let's not say it's going to win it. Right. Where did I put the other fly which? Was it on your bag? Oh shit. <gasps> Oops. That's Oh no. <laughs> We're going to have to go one. Ooh, nearly put it in the trees. What I looked and thought was the best spot. But, because he knows this, he's actually started halfway down the glide, which is telling me that the fish might still be in the slower water. Right, absolute disaster. You've just watched me tie two flies for this rig. Unfortunately, in a rush to stand up and get fishing, I've lost the second fly. I'm absolutely heartbroken. It's a fairly big olive nymph. I'm going to have to go with what I've got now. Let's hope it's good enough. Stay on, stay on. Yes! In your face! Yes! Think you're hard enough to take on the Morgans? Ah! Right, there's no two ways about it, I've just had my butt kicked. Howell's fish really well though and he's also fish clever. He had a quick look round, he saw the caddis hatching off that I didn't. Now really I should have known that because I fished this river further up a couple of days ago and there were caddis. I went for the olive, I thought I was going to have a bit more time to catch up with him than that but he went straight for a caddis fly imitation and nailed it first time. Good on you Hal. Oh mate, that was great. <laughs> 16 <laughs> minutes that took you man. Unbelievable. Listen, great fishing. I ran up here right? I know. I had a couple of takes up here but I, I don't know if you found this. Um, underneath electricity lines. Yep. As I was coming back down, I thought, right. And it all, I don't know why, static or whatever, it pulls fish in. I was, I was trying to tell people at home and then I, it just came down and it just went. I went, oh no, I can't tell you at the moment. And I got it in the net. So what did you tie? I tied one little generic fluff nymph. Right. Where are they gone? There we go, it's down here. And oh, no, no, no. I also oh, had a hold bit of on, hold on. I had a bit of an Look at sleeve. this. Now, strictly speaking, this isn't a material, mate. This is rigging. My plan was to size some lighter, more imitative flies and get them down with some split shot. The problem was the second fly I tied, I lost. <laughs> <laughs> right, so let's see. So I, was, I was stuck with a tiny little kind of olivey, grey, fluffy thing. Off him? That's nice. That would have done a job. It would have. Probably in more than 16 minutes. I thought that was the winner, mate. Split I thought shot. I'd got you there. Yeah, that, I mean, I, w I did think about this as well, putting a bit, few split shot in the bag, but... Uh, uh, well done! Fair play, mate. That was great. Unlucky, unlucky. Brilliant. I tell you what, gorgeous river. It's cracking, isn't it? Loads of fish. Now we can fish it properly. Carry on. Without you. Bye! <laughs>
27,000. Peter waves around a bag of old rotting fish to attract the beachworms. The gin clear Hampshire chalk streams could get even clearer in time for the mayfly season 2016. The British Environment Agency has revised its permits covering discharges from watercress farms on the River Itchen. This is the first step towards cutting the levels of phosphate pollution in the river. Now, do you want to win an Angling Trust cap, polo shirt and hoodie? The Angling Trust is aiming to improve fish habitats by taking part in an international survey with counterparts in the USA, Ireland and Australia. It takes five minutes, stick in the link on the screen onto your browser. An extraordinary looking deep water fish has washed up on the eastern seaboard of the USA. The Lancet fish was found on a North Carolina beach. The six foot fish have large mouths and razor sharp teeth. Incredibly, locals released it and it swam off. And finally, researchers have found a underwater graveyard of giant fish off the coast of Angola. This film shows the carcasses of four large marine creatures, a whale shark and three rays lying at the bottom of the ocean floor. Each is surrounded by about 50 scavengers in a food frenzy, giving new insights into how large sea creatures are recycled when they die. You are now up to date with Fishing Britain News. Fishing for facts, landing the stories. Thank you, David. Now it's time for the target, and so far, everybody has struggled with a pole. Well, now we've got a pro, a member of the Daiwa Gordon League. It's time for the target challenge. It's another target challenge from Fishing Britain, and this week we've got this guy. My name's Mark Treasure, and I'm here to take the challenge. Excellent. Just as a quick recap, he's got a chuck a bean bag. He's got a pole cup a bean bag into the center of the target. He's then got to chuck a plug in and flick some fluff. He's already got his bean bag ground bait replication in, and he's now on the long wobbly pole, getting it down to the end. Now he should be a professional at this. And look at that. First time off the back of the rollers and not a single thing spilt. Now he's going in at a bit of a strange angle here, but he's getting it down to the end. This is almost perfect position. Look at this. Without any hesitation, he's obviously done some pole cuffing in his time. And being the captain of the Dial Gordon League, he should be an excellent pole cupper. And here comes the casting of the plug. He's going for the overhead approach. And he went over the top on that one this time. He's going to be reeling that back in again and having another plug at it. Another plug, get it? Right. And he's going for the same technique yet again. And he's missed, he's bringing that one back. This is taking a little bit of time. He's wasting a little bit of time on this one. He's done so well with the ground bait, so well with a pole cup. And now he's on the plug, he's struggling. When he try an underarm, no, it's still going for the top. Oh, he's off to the left hand side. Come on, Mark. This one, this one. He goes for an adjustment and he's still not, he's still on the left hand side. Come on, Mark. He's taking his time with his plug. Obviously, he's in, he's in, he's got the plug in. Excellent, excellent. Right, that means he's now just got that bit of fluff to flop in there. It's already set at the right distance. He's just got to get it to land just inside the target. Come on, Mark, just inside the target. Oh, it looks like this is going to take some time. He's got a big swing. He, he tries to put a bit more of his whole entire body into the cast. He might have been able to make it. Clearly, we've sped up this little bit because it takes some amount of time for him to get anywhere near it. And in the end, we kind of gave up and it just went on forever. Well, I think the uh, grown bait throw in was very good. Um, I think the potting was excellent. The lure was acceptable and i don't think fly fishing should be part of this challenge i think it should have stopped at that point it went pretty badly actually didn't it let's be honest <laughs> it did <laughs> never mind let's have a look at the scoreboard and we'll see what we've got here now right terry bromwell still at the top with a one minute 31 and mark treasure comes in at the bottom with a four minutes 38 it looks like he's going to be there for a while well done mark showed us exactly how to use a pole not so good on the fly rods. Don't worry, next time I'll see you, I'll give you a few pointers. Now, are you sitting comfortably? It's time for a story. Charlie Jacobi's off filming fishing with Jeremy Fisher and Toad of Toad Hall. 
Now children, once upon a time there was a childhood that had no fishing in it. Well, Beatrix Potter soon put a stop to that. The Lakeland authoress was not all flopsy bunnies and hunker munker. She put some famously violent scenes in her books, including the big bad rabbit literally being blown apart by a shotgun. And then there was Jeremy Fisher. He was out after minnows. Most people remember him accidentally hooking a pike. Well, it was a trout. And you can still fish for them on the tarn above Beatrix Potter's home in Cumbria, Tarn House, where she based her 1906 book. Well, I'm at Hilltop Farm in the Lake District, home to one of the most famous anglers in Britain, Jeremy Fisher. Now let's get some background on this great fishing story. Field Sports Channel's new intern, Tom, will attempt to read the tale of Jeremy Fisher. Once upon a time, there was a frog called Mr. Jeremy Fisher. Fisher. Once upon a time, there was a child. Oh my God. Once upon a time, <laughs> the water was all slippy sloppy in the, in the larder and in the back passage. All slippy sloppy in his back, back larder. <laughs> God, this is never gonna work. I'll get some worms and go fishing and catch my dish of minnows for my dinner, said Mr. Jeremy Fisher. Minnows. I will get some worms and go fishing and catch, <laughs> catch a dish of minnow. Poor lad, it's his first day. But a minnow, I mean, what are they teaching kids? Back on the tarn and Jeremy Fisher is not bringing us much luck. There's a page in the book where minnows, or minnows, are laughing at him. I can't even find any minnows. I can find caddis on the side of the little dam at one end of the tarn, so I give that a go. Another angler trying his luck is tarn specialist and editor of Sporting Rifle magazine, Peter Carr. I always start with nymphs, fish, fish deeper, uh, nymphs are wets. Uh, if I'm in a good casting mood and everything's going right, right I'm, I might use a team of three. If it works, you know, if sometimes it doesn't, and I'm casting like a child, and I just put one fly on. But uh, no, names, traditional wets I use a lot, uh, and most of the Lakeland Tarns, uh, Kate McLaren. Uh, I like the Soldier Palmer, uh, that's great for just sort of skipping on the surface. Uh, and then uh, Pheasant Tail, uh, Gold Head Hairs here, that's, that's a favourite. I've tried to uh, fish for char in the lakes for the last three years, uh, every opportunity, uh, with no luck. The closest I ever got was on one tarn, a very small char, definitely char, white fins on, uh, white edges to the fins. And uh, in all the books you see them in the, in the breeding colours, but uh, most of the year they're like a slaty grey colour with the white underneath and, and the, the white dots with red and they're still quite a pretty fish, but nothing like uh, in the mating time, but he just lost them lost at the net. So. Ah, I'm afraid to say the net never lived much longer than either. <laughs> Peter also has views on how you pronounce M-I-N-N-O-W. Like minnow with an O-W, minnow. Minnow, minnow, and what are. Singin. <laughs> St John even. The landlord of the local pub which sells the fishing tickets here is more hopeful and he has some angling documents that date from the time when Beatrix Potter was living here. Here we've got some permits and these I have to say were retrieved from Ambleside Tip. I do enjoy a few moments of pleasure when I get up to the tarn and uh, when I'm fishing up there um, they're teasing me by bouncing and jumping in front of me and, and yet not biting but uh, I have very successfully caught a few on occasions. Up at the tarn and Tom starts to blame Jeremy Fisher for our lack of success with Lakeland Trout. Tom, you can't do that. That's awful. We pack up and head down south. When you get no joy from a frog, try a toad. There is not much fishing in the wind in the willows. Toad prefers caravans and motor cars. Poop, poop. Ratty is to be found out after a Thames trout. It's more about that halcyon atmosphere, which is hard to find on the Pang and the Thames, where the children's author Kenneth Graham based the book, which came out two years after the tale of Jeremy Fisher. But it may still be found further up the Thames in the Cotswolds. We are out on the lovely River Colne in Gloucestershire, which is offered for rent via Fly Fisher Group and may be found on the rodsonrivers.com website. It's not so manicured, it's not so overfished, there's not so many rods on the river, which I think gives it you know, a real benefit. Um, this is pretty much private, there's a footpath just up at the side, but other than that, it's, you know, it's a private, private area of about two miles, which you just don't get that down, down in the chalk streams. They stock this water and we are here as a few dozen fish from Bybury Fish Farms go in. Bybury supplies waters as far away as Scotland. Yeah, they do, they get stocked all over the country, um, where there's delivery uh, just today over in Wales, 
uh, of brown trout going into some um, wild rivers there, um, up to Scotland, the Lake District, all over. Um, our fish are known for being quite hard fighting. Um, it's a very good body shape, very good spot pattern. Uh, they're a very popular fish. This river is only a few hundred yards upstream from the fish ponds, so these brown trout could not be more local. Small-minded Ratty and Moly would be delighted, towed with probably rather have it stocked with arapaima and Nile perch. Well, I can imagine him with a split cane rod for a start, I'd hope. Um, and uh, I'd imagine his patience wouldn't be terribly, terribly prolonged, so you'd imagine he'd have to catch quite a few quite quickly. Um, but yeah I, think, yeah, I think this would be a good place for him to do it. And, and he could quite easily be up in the house up there now, you don't know. <laughs> There are good fish to be caught here, we can see them. The head of the Kempsford Angling Club recently caught a £3.8 ounce brownie. Finally, Tom, the man who can't pronounce the name of Britain's humblest fish, shows he's got it where it counts. He catches a wild trout. Ratty would be pleased, even if Jeremy Fisher finds trout a bit hard to handle. For more about fishing on Jeremy's Tarn, visit towerbankarms.co.uk. And to fish the cull, go to flyfishergroup.com or rodsonrivers.com. Thank you, Charlie. And now it's time for more Charlie with Hooked on YouTube. Charlie Jacoby here. This is my weekly roundup of the best fishing on YouTube. A lot of sea angling in this week's haul. The Water's Edge TV writes to me to suggest his channel, and it is lovely. Instant subscribe. Here he is in Norfolk fishing for bass with fresh peeler crab. I struggle to do a week of hooked on YouTube without them, and they are back again this week. Canal Gratis.se is cod fishing in the Stockholm archipelago. On the other side of the Atlantic, kayak fishing tales has Jim Sammons and Jeff Herman teaming up with Omar Araka of Caribbean Outfitters to go after another of the world's most popular fish, the tarpon. I find these kinds of films mesmerising. There's a will he won't he quality to whether or not what the bait or lure is doing will attract the fish. Fishing with Rod calls this film the stubborn sucker. Now have you considered shark fishing from a high seat? Team Rebel Fishing TV is doing what he calls extreme ladder fishing for sharks, catching some nice lemons and you can see a technique for de-hooking these toothy fish with a piece of mono. Off to Australia for iFish Lake Tulondo trout fishing. iFish TV is hard at work in the state of Victoria. There is wonderful fishing tackle history to be had at the Mitchell Reel Museum channel, including some historic fishing films. Here is a clip about a fishing expedition to Great Bear Lake Lodge hosted by Garcia and Seagram's distillers in 1965. Then practically undiscovered as a fishing destination today, Great Bear Lake, the fourth largest lake in North America, is one of the most popular on the continent. And finally, how do fish work? The Go Fishing Education Centre is talking swim bladders with the help of a giant fish replica and in a lovely southern drawl. Click on the links to watch the videos or you will find them in this film's description if you would like to send in a video for hooked on YouTube, ping me the link, charlie at fieldsportschannel.tv. Well, folks, that's it for another week. I hope you've enjoyed it. If you have, don't forget, hit that subscribe button. And if you want to keep up to date with all the other programmes on the channel, visit our website, fieldsportschannel.tv, and fill out that constant contact form. Don't forget to like our Facebook page and follow us on Twitter. I'll see you next week on Fishing Britain. <laughs>